Welcome to the Startup Grind. All right, so let's go back to the mantra of uh, Startup Grind, okay? It's about educating, inspiring, and connecting. So before we introduce Dan, Dan is going to introduce a technology that he wants you to try out by Brian Ball. And what is that technology, Dan? Um, well, so... Check, check, check. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, Mohammed has little cards uh, that will explain to you how to use this app called uh, Weave. If you search the app store for Weave Networking, you'll find it. Um, basically what it is is it's kind of like um, Tinder for uh, connecting professionally instead of connecting personally. Um, and I find it's a really easy way, if you've come to this and you don't know very many people here, it's a really easy way to meet people and it shows you their LinkedIn profile so you can have kind of a way to know um, what would be interesting to talk about. You can see what they're interested in, what field they're in, what past companies they've worked for, what they're studying, things like that from their LinkedIn profile. And so, and you also know if they want to meet you as well. So it makes it easy to walk up to people and strike up a conversation without kind of wondering, does this person really want to talk to me? And then what would I talk to them about? It makes it a lot easier. So I really like it and uh, we met a gentleman out in San Francisco that actually made it. I think it's cool, so I, especially in groups like this, I think it's fun to use it. So, so let's talk about that gentleman real quick. Is this his first startup? No, Brian, uh, um, and I, I mean, we just met very much in passing. I, that was my first time meeting him, but he uh, sold um, a company called Decide to eBay. That was a, uh, um, a shopping, um, it was basically, you know the little flight tracker uh, like if you search for flights and it shows you when the price is likely to go up or down, Decide was like that except for things you can buy on the web. Because you know, even like the pants you might buy on Target.com or something like that, the prices actually do go up and down. People might not know that. And so Decide was a service like that that kind of told you when prices were going to go up and down. So he sold that and he actually left eBay. I don't know if any of you guys know what an earnout is, but if you sell your company, a lot of times they try and lock you in to the new company for a certain period of time. He left eBay before his earnout was over and left some money there to start this company. So I, I thought that was a pretty cool story. He must believe in it quite a bit to you know, leave before he gets all his money from the past one. So. Well, let's speak of leaving a company, right? Because you actually have left New Mind, which is the company you founded in 2003. Not, not totally left it, but I, I'm on sabbatical. Yeah. Flex time. Yeah. All right. Not just flex time once a, a week, right? It's actually going to be a couple months? Yeah, a couple months. My last uh, day at New Mind was February 1st, and I'll go back May 1st. So, so 10 or 11 years ago, you, you started New Mind in your garage? Um, no, I didn't have a garage at that point. I was in a little apartment, so. So let's talk about the story of Mind then. Sure. You're from Sturgis. Yep. Not too far away from here. You travel 30 minutes north and you're in Kalamazoo. What brought you to Kalamazoo from Sturgis and then what started you thinking about a new company in the IT business? Um, well, uh, we had always, you know, Sturgis is a small town and so, you know, we're pretty close to a couple of other big towns. So I was in Kalamazoo a lot growing up, so I had an affinity for it. I actually was born here, and then we moved there for work, for my dad's work. Um, but uh, what brought me here was essentially work. Um, <clears throat> I, I got married to a gal from Kalamazoo. Um, there's a song about that, I think. Um, and, uh, and at first, we lived kind of halfway between Sturgis and Kalamazoo because we didn't really know what we wanted to do. And then I got a job in Kalamazoo, and then it was clear it just makes more sense to live in Kalamazoo. So it was very practical. Um, and I guess the second part was what made me want to start New Mind. And uh, basically, ever since I was a kid, I knew I wanted to be an. I wanted to try my hand at starting things, starting companies, starting, you know, making ideas real. Always like really appealed to me. Um, you know, figuring things out. I, I don't know. It just um, making my making my own way always appealed to me in various forms, and so um, you know it started with a paper out. Really, I mean, I was trying to get a paper out for like three years, and they had all these rules about how old you had to be and all this stuff. And so finally, <clears throat> and which is kind of sad because you can't if you're a little kid that likes to wants to be an entrepreneur, you can't do that anymore. 
you have to find something else because that's gone. Um, but uh, uh, but I, I remember getting my paper out like on the day that I was finally met all the rules age wise and all that stuff. Like after asking them over and over. So. Um, so that was my first business, and it really was a business. Like they sent me a bill, each paper cost a certain amount, and then I collected directly from my customers uh, a slightly larger amount per paper. And so it really was like a totally a, all the little pieces of a functioning business, except I had a bike. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I really knew I wanted to do that, and so um, we're married, and some people started uh, asking me to do technology work on the side. I was working at Pfizer. Um, Pfizer wasn't signing my checks. There was a bunch of contracts in between me and them, but I was basically there all the time um, uh, writing software. And uh, so, yeah, it, uh, it, that opportunity was basically just to say yes to, we've got this technology work we want you to do on the side. So I started doing it on the side, but immediately I was thinking, oh, maybe this develops into, like maybe I start a little company around this. and I started thinking of names and making little logos on my computer and you know so it was always like in my mind like when's going to be the opportunity to like start a company um, and I remember a distinct feeling of uh, I better do this now because I'm married and I'm going to have kids and there's going to be a lot of uh, commitments and the, the tension the, the friction of doing this is just only going to get greater so I better do it now um, and sort of uh, be, get ahead of that <laughs> um, if I can. So, um, so I, I think that was like the early thoughts around why to start it. Now, were you still working with uh, yep. Pfizer? So you put one foot in and kept one foot in the other side of the business. Yeah, that was just, I mean, it was just a couple hours here and there. Maybe I had 10 hours and I'm working 40 hours at Pfizer and that was okay. And then I had 20 hours and I'm working 40 hours at Pfizer and that starts to stretch me. and then, you know, at a certain point, it, there was more to do than I had time for. And so I basically went to uh, the guy that I worked for at the time, and I said, you know, uh, his name was Ed. He's a great, great guy, really good guy. Uh, and I said, you know, Ed, I got this stuff I want to do on the outside, and really, I don't want to have to make a choice between working here and doing this stuff on the outside, because I'm really, I'm afraid I'm afraid that I'm gonna pick the outside. Kind of, it was kind of a really soft ultimatum, you know? Um, and what I really want, Ed, is I wanna be able to work for you 30 hours so I can do more of this outside. And he was very gracious and he said, yep, you can work for me for 30 hours, no big deal. Um, and so I carved a little bit more time out and a little bit more time. And then finally, Pfizer was always, with all these different contracts, they were always kind of at the end of the year, oh, who are we gonna bring back? Are we gonna re-sign contracts with these same companies? Blah, 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 blah. And so um, at, a, at the end of a certain year, it was all vague. And we kind of, you know, we went into the holidays not really knowing if we were gonna come back. And then around, uh, and so I kind of had in my mind, maybe I'll just give this a shot for real. Uh, so I did, and then right around maybe February 1st, they called everybody and they're like, oh yeah, we're re-signing the contracts. So people were you know, out of work for maybe a month um, or reassigned to other contracts by the companies they were technically working for. Uh, and, but at that point, I was confident enough that this was gonna work. So I just said, nope, not coming back. And you know, two feet in at that point using your terminology. And you didn't burn any bridges then? Oh no, no, I actually still, we still have a poker game. Um, it's been less and less frequent, but the, old, the Pfizer guys, we still, we'll still play poker every once in a while. They're good guys. So what does New Mind do now versus what it did when you started in 2003? Yeah, what, what it did when I started in 2003 was very, very rudimentary. It was, you know, small businesses, computers break, and somebody has to come and fix them and I was the guy that came and fixed them. Uh, or small businesses are just starting up and they need you know, their server set up and all their computers set up and then somebody to maintain that stuff and make sure there's no viruses and stuff. Um, and I was, I was that guy. I don't know if I'm holding this wrong or touching it in a way that it doesn't like or um, <laughs> inappropriately touching the microphone, I don't know. Um, <laughs> All right, so, uh, so yeah, what was the question? That was a pretty distracting <laughs> little beat there. So how does New Mind 
change over the years with what they do? Um, yeah, it changed. It changed a lot. I mean, when it was just me, um, and it was just me for quite a while. Like, I hired little people here, like not 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 miniature people. Like, this is a miniature table, <laughs> but like, I, I hired. I made like kind of small hires um, here and there. People working part time. Like, we people asked me to do websites. So I'm like, fine, I'll do websites. And I hired a guy that when we had website work to do, he would do it part time. And when we didn't have it, he wouldn't do it. You know. But it was never like a real hire, like this person is fully in this company just as much as I am for a very long time. So it was kind of just me and some people I could get to help me for years and years and years. And it was sort of sawtooth, like it seemed like things were going great and then something bad would happen and it was just back to, eh, it's going to go great. And then, you know, and, and I was just making every mistake that you could possibly make. like. Uh, the number of possible mistakes was getting smaller and smaller and smaller because I was making all of them. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and finally, like, when things started to go well, I think it was because, you know, I had made so many mistakes by that point that there were just so few that were possible to be made. Um, so I, I learned the hard way, you know, like, that's, and that's, I think Kevin has said, said similar things in his interview, like, I'm just sort of bullheaded and, you know, just, do things the hard way, I guess. So, uh, uh, so then when it really took off, um, you know, I hired a longtime friend that I'd work, worked with for a long time. He was like the first serious real hire where I was like, you know, I basically took all the money that the company was making and offered it to him and figured I'd find a way to make some more money if I didn't have to spend all my time servicing these accounts. And then he started servicing the accounts and then I found a way to go get more accounts so I could pay myself. <laughs> um, uh, and that was, that's, his name's Ryan, and he's now a part owner of Newmind. He's still with the company, he's still good friends. We were in each other's weddings, so it's, I've had very good luck working with friends. Um, some people say I don't do that. Uh, I've had nothing but good luck. Um, I've, had, I've had some hard things happen along those lines, working with friends and family, but they're all, you know, good, good growth came out of it. It wasn't like, long-lasting permanent negative consequences in any Isn't sense. Is because you're Irish? I don't know. Um, I just, I think like when I started the company, and I still do sort of, the value wasn't like make something super successful and get famous or make a billion dollars or anything like that. It was really simple. It was I want to do what I love with people that I love. And so if that's what you want, hiring your friends makes a lot of sense because you already know that you like them a lot. And you're, it's just another excuse to get paid to spend time together. So if that's, if that's your goal in mind, you know, so maybe I've sacrificed some efficiency or some other things. I've certainly, we've certainly sacrificed money over the years in the name of doing what we love with people that we love. We've had some customers that we did not love. And, and so we fired those customers. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's so not all businesses operate like that. Some businesses, change the way they do business to make, the, to make those people happy. And we have done that in certain cases, but in some cases, the people that you're working with are just toxic, and it's better to forego the money and get the toxic people out of the situation, even if they're the people that are paying you. And so we've done that quite a few times. I can relate with that. I had what's called the test lab for clients. Lasted about a month and a year, thumbs up or thumbs down. So. Yep. And you don't have to fire them in a rude way. You just, uh, we, we um, I'll use a nice name for it. We had a different name, but we called it the jerk price. Um, and, you know, as soon as we knew they were a jerk, they got the jerk price. And that was a very soft way of firing them because they didn't want to pay what the price became if we had to deal with their toxic nature. And so most of them chose not to be clients anymore. So it wasn't, you know, we didn't have to be mean or rude or, you know, do anything, you know, along those lines, we just, you know, it's this painful to do business with this person, so we're going to make the money match the pain, and most of them didn't want to participate after that. So then how much is growth a factor in running your business? Um, yeah, I mean, at first it wasn't because I was making all those mistakes, but then as soon as things started um, to take off, it was a big factor. Um, it was, you know, we've oscillated back and forth between 
trying to hire people that are fully skilled up for what we need in finding a lot of people that were fully skilled up for if we could travel back in time 30 years they would have been the perfect people for us to hire but it's what we found was if there's certain things that we're looking for out of our people it's really hard to unteach someone that is really set in their ways like it has to be this way or you guys are doing it all wrong um, because in certain cases like we're embracing things like the cloud and mobility and a bunch of stuff early before those things were you know when those things were sort of fads you know all those things went through a stage of you know uh, this is kind of just a fad you know um, back when the iPod was out no one would have thought that everybody's primary computing device was going to be an iPod like device that also took phone calls like everyone if you would have said that to someone they would have been like you sir are weird and I don't know what you're talking about um, so so we were kind of ahead of some of that stuff doing things in a new way so it made it made, made growth and hiring really difficult so for a while we were kind of using a gardening approach where we were hiring people that maybe didn't have all the skills we need and for their attitude and their work ethic and then training them um, and now actually you know the industry there's more people in the industry with the skills that we need and so now we're almost like flip back so we're some people are coming in into internships or into entry-level positions and growing up in the company and some people are really we can just go out in the marketplace and find yep this person speaks our language they get it they have studied the same technologies that we're implementing all those pieces and parts are in place and so hopefully it's getting easier to grow i hope um but for a while it was tough well let's talk about being in kalamazoo then because you gotta have to have talent to yep. bring them here does everyone work here in Kalamazoo in New Mine? Nope. Um, we've kind of always been, I think, with embracing the cloud early and embracing mobility early, we've sort of always had uh, the idea in the company of we should be location agnostic. We should be location agnostic. We should be vendor agnostic. So anything we're implementing for our customers needs to work on Android as well as it works on iPhone, as well as it works on Apple, as well as it works on, you know, we're not aligning to one way of seeing the world. We want to be open to, well, how do you see the world? Whatever we're going to bring you has to work with how you see the world. We're not going to force you into our perspective. So, um, so that's just sort of always been the way we've chosen to, to work. And so that lent itself very well then to um, people you know, starting out their career here with us while they're still in college or maybe right after they um, I've had a, uh, graduated, I've had a number of people actually get married, and I don't know if you've noticed this trend, but if you get married, where are you most likely to live? Near the, near the husband's family or the wife's family? The wife's family, yes. So we've had a large number of, uh, uh, of new minders that were fine here, get married, and then go move someplace else in the country because that's where their wife's family lives. Um, or for some other reason, but they've just continued to work with the company. Like they moved f from Kalamazoo, but that didn't change the fact that we still needed them and they still wanted to work with us. And so we've got people in Minneapolis, uh, two people in Charleston, South Carolina, um, had somebody in San Jose, but them living there, basically it, it, the economics didn't work out. Like we couldn't afford to pay them what they needed to make and they had a bunch of opportunities to make more money because the economics out there are totally different, you know. Um, so, yeah. So then let's step back a little bit and go to what does New Mind do now? Um, a lot of different stuff. Um, so I think the core of what we love to do and what we're best at is to partner with partner with companies that, um, you know, we, we kind of separate companies into three different categories, okay? Um, uh, there's small and growing companies. So that's people that, you know, they're just kind of using the tools, the consumer tools that are available, they're running fast, and we can help them, and that's all right. Um, Mid-sized and scaling companies, they get, they're getting to a point where they really, really need us. Because what happens in mid-sized and scaling companies is they reach this inflection point where none of the old way that they did things when they were 5, 10, 15, 20 employees IT wise work anymore. Every system that they've been relying on and way of doing things that they've been doing it, it's all breaking all at the same time. 
it doesn't scale. It, they can't have 100 people on the same systems and same methods and ways that they had 10 people on. Um, and so we're really helpful there to help them with you know, our resources and tools um, and their IT department. So we're helping them you know, pick better tools for messaging and collaboration, pick better tools for CRM, implement those, their networks, their help desk, how they do that, how they service people. So think of everything that an IT department does on the operations side of IT. Uh, we, we call it the operations side and the marketing side. The marketing side is like the website, the social media, um, all that stuff. If you need that stuff, talk to Carl Brown. Um, we don't do that. We do the operation side. Um, uh, uh, if you're a big company, um, I think Maestro does a pretty good job of that stuff too. Not um, the, yeah. Um, so uh, so yeah. I mean, um, so so th those companies work. That's our sweet spot. Midsize and scaling companies is our sweet spot because they really need a lot of help making that turn picking better tools. It's a great opportunity for them to modernize a lot of stuff. They have a lot of technical debt. If you don't know what that is, Google it. It's a fan fascinating idea that you make poor technology decisions and you get further, further in technical debt and you gotta get your way out of it at some point. Um, and then large companies actually come and seek us out. Large or companies and organizations, a lot of the large organizations we work with are actually school districts. Um, they seek us out usually because, not for that kind of deep engagement where we're holistically looking at their whole organization, usually because we have some skill set that they lack. So um, the school, school districts have been seeking us out because we understand a bunch of Google tools that it turns out are a perfect fit for them cost-wise functionality-wise, security-wise, it's really aligned. A lot of Google's tools are really aligned perfectly, particularly through K through 12. Um, so, uh, so we engage on all those different areas, but the, the key one is in that mid-size and scaling company that their IT department is understaffed, all their IT is kind of not scaling, breaking, um, and we partner with them, basically. We, we basically want to make their IT, give them the IT of a much bigger, much smarter company for you know, a quarter of the price that they'd have to pay if they hired all the specialists directly into the company that they would need to accomplish that. So how big is Newmont in terms of number of employees and then uh, revenue now? And then how does that play into like, partnering with companies like Google? Yeah, um, so partnering with bigger companies was a huge driver for our growth. We, you know, we were early on a number of, uh, seeing a number of different trends that companies were going to need. And so we learned, we, we, we skilled up in those areas, you know, two or three years before our competition did. And so people like Google noticed that and invited us to be, you know, they, they had no partner channel program to speak of. But they realized, hey, if we're going to address the, the business community and to a certain extent the education community, we need channel partners. We need people that are going to be the boots on the ground. We're the, I always call it, they're the engineers in the sky and they hand down these technologies. But then you want to get them on the phone. You want anybody to show up. You know, good luck. Um, so we're kind of their boots on the ground. Um, and that knowing that stuff when nobody else knew it drove a huge amount of growth because you know all of a sudden all, all kinds of people want to use this technology nobody else knows how to do it there's like at the at the early stages there's like 10 companies in the world that know how to do this and all these companies are deciding hey we we want to do this tell, uh, google tell us who can help us implement and they're like well, let's count the companies we can send you to. Okay, um, so so it was. There's a lot of inbound from being early. There was a lot of inbound demand that happened with um, that happened with uh, Google's messaging and collaboration technologies. That's now happening with their Chromebooks and education technologies, and I believe it will soon happen with another sector that Google's not that big in yet. Um, I think telepresence robotics is kind of another. That's that's early, people don't know how cool it is yet and how useful it will be to their businesses, but, but New Minds just spent the last year learning about that, tooling up, we'll spend a couple more years, and then you'll start to see, instead of being on a video, um, kind of a video call with somebody, 
they will wheel around your office on a robot and they'll just walk up to you and say, hey, hey John, how's it going? Can I ask you about that project? You got a second? And an iPad. Yeah, an, an, an iPad with legs, basically. Wheels. Like a Segway, like a mini Segway with an iPad on top. Can I get a high five too? Uh, high five not included yet. You could kind of slap them in the face if you want to. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that I kind of rambled on there. I don't even know if I'm still on the question or not, but we'll we'll go to the second part of the question, which is the size. So oh yeah, the size. Help you get to where you are now in terms of size. Yep. So we chose to grow the business with kind of a sort of three ring approach. We want to be able to address the needs of any. Comp it's kind of a lofty goal for a business our size, but we wanted to be able to address the needs of any customer anywhere in the United States. So the way we did that was uh, we have a core team, which is our, our special sauce. They are the brain trust of the company. That's about 15 people. Now, since I left, we've hired three or four more. Um, so it's, how many have we hired, Tyler? Three more? So now it's 18. Um, uh, so that's the core team. Uh, should all talk to Tyler. Tyler's our high school uh, wonder kid. Um, we're gonna just keep, keep hiring younger and younger people. So we'll just have babies answering the phone at some point. Um, but uh, but uh, yeah, so man, I'm, I'm distracting myself so bad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so size, at 18, that's the core. Uh, then we have uh, our help desk is staffed by people that are not W2 employees. That's a shared resource. It's shared with um, other organizations. So it gives us the ability to scale up and down those resources as needed. Also our NOC, a NOC network operation center, those are the people that watch the devices. So, so the NOC team is watching all the signals from like, if you, get an, if you get a virus on your laptop or your phone or your server is running out of space, the NOC team's addressing that, the help desk is addressing the people. So help desk helps people, NOC helps uh, devices and systems. Um, those people aren't our direct employees, but we work with them on a daily basis. We need them to function, um, and that works really well. And then the third, the third layer is, uh, uh, is, a, is a service network where we can truck roll to any place in the United States, um, and those people aren't our direct employees either. So with 18 people as W-2s, with that structure, we actually have the capability to let bring, say, 70 or 80 people's worth of labor to bear at a pretty short notice on a customer need, um, which is pretty cool. Um, so that's, this, that's, this, that's the way the size works. It's always a weird question because when people ask you about size, particularly customers, they're at, they're, what they're really asking you about is capability. How capable are you? How able are you to meet big needs, small needs? Are you flexible? Um, so that's why I give the long explanation instead of we're 18 people. Um, uh, and then revenue-wise, uh, uh, when I handed off to Matt, we were basically, um, you know, you have big months, you have small months, but we were basically at a 10 million um, run rate in annual revenue. You talk about mistakes. Let's go through some ups and downs that you've had over the last 10 years. What would those be? How have you dealt with them? Oh, man. Um, I think I think probably the biggest mistake is not being a better listener, um, and I've learned how to be a better listener from my wife and from other people in the company, um, and from other people in my life that are really good listeners, you know. Um, but I think that one skill, you know, is a bucket that I could drop, you know tons and tons of mistakes into and categorize like if I started ticking down all the mistakes like oh yeah but that would have been solved if I was a better listener oh and that one would have been solved if I was a better listener so yeah so that's a that's a I've kind of identified that as a root cause um, and I get really excited and I like to talk and I like to relate with people but that's a strength and then the other side of that is sometimes I don't just shut my mouth and hear what really smart people have to say um, and that can, that can just cause problems, misunderstandings, and all kinds of things. So. Can you give a specific example of that? 
Um, yeah, I think I, I look back at uh, different customers that we've lost. I'm trying to think of one, the story of one. Um, but we've certainly lost customers because I didn't listen, really listen to the root of what the customer wanted or needed. And so we solved around the root of it, but then three or six months later, we realized, you know, if we'd have kept digging just a little bit more, we would have gotten to the thing, but now it's kind of too late. You know, we missed our chance. We didn't get at what really needed to happen. Um, uh, I mean, I think, um, I think if I was a better listener, I'd have probably made some, uh, there's one employee in particular that we probably, um, that we probably let go too late. Probably should have, and it was more painful for them because we kind of let it drag on too long. Um, and it would have been much better for the relationship if we would have let them, if, if I would have, you know, stop being in my own head and really listen to the situation, listen to the employee, listen to the other employees in the company, listen to the customers, I would have probably been able to let them go six months earlier before they hurt customers or uh, relationships could have, were hurt, were hurt more than they could have been, you know? So, um, and certainly in my personal life, you know, um, being a good listener manifests itself most with your significant other. And I think that's, you know, um, running a business is really, really difficult. Um, and I've maybe at one point or another put every aspect of my life in jeopardy in order to keep pushing ahead with New Mind, including my marriage. And my marriage wouldn't have been in jeopardy if I was a better listener. I mean, that's the, to that's the total like, story. Like, if I was a good listener, marriage never goes in jeopardy. I'm a bad listener. <laughs> Marriage goes in jeopardy, <laughs> regardless of the pressure level at the company. Um, but I think the higher the pressure, the more my weaknesses come out. You know. So how does your wife help you during the, the low times in the company? You know, and specifically, about three or four years into the the company moving forward. Um, yeah. Well, basically, what happened three or four years into the company moving? Uh, we didn't. Uh, I should have hit this in the timeline, but basically what happened is we got all our eggs in one basket. We had um, the company that I had previously worked for at Pfizer, um, that had a contract with Pfizer, got this enormous contract uh, with a big, uh, big company, and they basically were like, all hands on deck, everyone we know, we want to hire all of you to work on this project. All their eggs are in that basket with this one project, and now they pull me in, and the other people that I've got part-time, and it looks like a beautiful situation, right? It's like every resource that NewMind has ever had is now 100% billable for the foreseeable future, you know. But basically what ended up happening there is that project started to go off the rails. The company that hired us, who I had all confidence would pay us, actually went bankrupt because all their eggs were in that basket. And once the project went off the rails, there was no way they could recover, and that left us you know, with basically, I had to start. I had to start completely over. I didn't get paid. You know, they got 30 days behind, 60 days behind, 90 days behind, 120 days behind. Didn't get paid. Had to lay everybody off um, and start over. And at that time, getting back to what my wife, you know, the key, the key moment where her input was so key was, I was so discouraged at that point. I was like, okay, it's been three, four years. I'm, you know, it. The experiment did not work. We have, I'm officially going to call it failure. Um, you know, and I, and I was, I had friends working with me and I had made their lives very difficult too. You know, they're like sort of, we went from everything looks amazing to nothing is amazing and you all have to find jobs in a very short time. Um, so what my wife said, which was so key basically at that time was very pragmatic. She just said, Hey, you know, you could go get a job now. You could fold up Newmind and go get a job, but I'll give you three months at another company before you go try and start another company. So there's really no point. It's just going to be a futile exercise. Why don't you just stick with this one? Um, and she was right. Like that, that's now I've lived with myself a little bit longer, and I know that that's true. I can't. It's a. It's a yeah. Let me turn yours on here. So I can 
it's just, just too fault proof so you don't run on the batteries, you know. So you just turn off your thumb whenever you're ready with that. Great. Are you going to do it again? You, you've taken leave from new mode. Do I start up here? Do I, and you're working on something here? new now. Yeah. You want to talk about what you're going to be doing in the future? Hello. So I'm interested in a couple different things, but the real, the re, one of the reasons for having this kind of like sabbatical time is to think about what is it? What is the best thing for me to do next? Um, so the areas of interest are, I really, really love stuff like this, community like this, and there's a community, and this a community extends all over the country. There's people all over the country doing this stuff and I meet them all the time. Um, and I really, really like being there at the beginning of things um, and helping people at the beginning of things, even if it's not my thing. Uh, so I've kind of identified my skills are most valuable between zero and 10 million in revenue. And probably the higher the revenue gets, the more my skills value diminish. So maybe it starts diminishing at five, at five million and by 10 million, you know, I'm, I'm less valuable. So. So that's where I want to be involved. And I, I've been advising a couple of different startups, and that's super fun. Um, I've dabbled a little bit in angel investing. I don't, I don't have a ton of money to do that with, but I just want to learn about it. And I'm, like I said, bullheaded. So the only way to learn about it is to do, do it. So um, I kind of characterize myself as a bad angel investor at this point, because I've, I haven't done it enough to be a good angel investor. Um, uh, so I'm looking at that. I'm looking at, you know, is there a spot in, uh, you know, I don't know too much about the venture capital community, but if there's a spot there where you're coaching and encouraging and helping, you know, that's something that, you know, might appeal to me. Um, and then there's the obvious stuff, right? Like go start another company. I've got a bunch of ideas. I've got, you know, r I know really smart people and some of them are, you know, willing to work on ideas as a side project, kind of like, Couple, couple of guys in a garage tinkering with a car, except the car is a company instead <laughs> and a technology product. Um, uh, so that's fun. The process of doing that is fun and discovering whether we have a good idea and whether there's traction for it. And, um, and so I'm doing that with a friend right now. Um, and also, I've heard, I've heard other entrepreneurs say, call the time in between companies halftime and you gotta like, go get a hot dog and go, you know, uh, stretch your legs. And so I'm trying to do a little, it's difficult. I just kind of booked up. I thought there was going to be a lot of rest in this two months, but I just said yes to a bunch of stuff and booked it all up. And there's not that much, but there are a couple, like I'm taking the family on vacation. I'm, so those are sort of the goals, the, the things I'm interested in, I'm sort of dabbling in. Um, but the, the, the project I'm working on with the buddy is, um, it's, it, it's called. So it's another friend. Um, you work with another friend. Yeah, so working with a friend. Cool. We've known each other for a long time. Um, he's actually here. He's right in the back. His name's Mike. Say hi to him. Um, he's a great developer. Don't don't hire him away for his current company and make it so that he doesn't have enough time to work on my project with me. Um, uh, so uh, <laughs> I'm resisting the I'm resisting the uh, the urge to look at Jen. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, so yeah, so what we're working on is, how many people have used mint.com? Anybody use mint.com? Okay, um, it's basically, for those of you that haven't used it, it's basically a dashboard that hooks up to your bank account, pulls in all the data about how you spend your money and sort of auto budgets. And sometimes it doesn't know what it's looking at, so it asks you some questions about how to categorize this or that, but it's much different than manually entering all of your transactions into some accounting software. Um, so it kind of auto creates a budget and tells you about your spending habits and all this stuff. And so what we're trying to do is basically um, uh, do the same thing except for people's time. Um, so instead of connecting to uh, the, uh, the bank account, we want to connect to uh, the calendar right now is one thing, but there's a number of different data sources that we think will be useful for time. Um, and particularly what we're interested in with that is, you know, with your bank account, you're optimizing for savings, 
you're optimizing for, you know, kind of is my spending as I intend it to be? You know, I seem to chronically spend way too much at coffee shops. That's just me. Like, I, uh, Mint compares you to other people uh, that are like you, and my comparison on coffee shops is embarrassing. Um, but, uh, but basically, instead of just optimizing, so if you move that over to time, people are optimizing their time. A lot of times when you use these productivity tools, they're kind of just built for trying to make you work more. I'm just trying to be more productive and work more, and just work more hours. Um, I don't know about you, but my sixth or seventh or eighth or ninth hour of the day is much less productive than my earlier hours. So there's a flow, there's a good balance and flow to my day where I've got enough open creative time and I've got enough task time to get stuff done and um, you know all the right pieces and parts are in place that I leave that day feeling like this is great. I actually happy, you know, like like all those things contribute to my happiness. So the kind of idea that we're um, messing around with is how do we optimize our time for balance and happiness? And I don't mean balance like some people when some people say work life balance. There, it's like the I've heard it. I've heard people say the Tim Ferriss perpetual motion nonsense. You know, it's it's like the four hour work week and. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about trying to work less because if you're passionate about what you're doing, you want to you wanna do it a lot. Um, I'm talking about the right mix of creative time so that you're not just going one meeting to the next, 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 and it feels like you should have gotten a lot done, but really you didn't and you're just frustrated. Um, so we want to optimize time for happiness and we think that productivity follows that, profit follows that rather than just optimizing for working one more hour. So why start it here? You traveled to the valley, you know, rather regularly over the last three or four years. Why in Kalamazoo? What, what is keeping you here? Um, well, I think there's a bunch of different things that are keeping me here. One, I feel like I feel like a lot of the benefits out there I can gain by visiting. So this Weave app and this guy Brian. We were just visiting. John was there. Muhammad was out there. Um, you know, and I can't tell you how many great connections and good people to know and relationships that I make just by being there and being in New York and being other places. Um, but living there, another level of commitment that requires a bunch of things that I'm not really prepared to give up, like a decent drive to work and not like sitting in traffic forever, or you know. Being able to, like people here, you know, you can get an apartment by yourself. You don't realize that in San Francisco, people that work at Google, that went to school at Harvard, that are amazingly brilliant people and make a lot of money, have two roommates to be able to afford their place. Like, um, I, have a, I, have a, I actually have a friend who's, the, uh, who's a very high up VP at a pharmaceutical company called Bayer. He's in charge of engineering, a certain part of their engineering for the entire North, Ameri uh, North America. And he has a nice house in a nice area in the, in, uh, um, in the Bay Area. And he takes a border, border to live in his house to offset how much his house costs. You know, this is somebody that's really at the pinnacle of his career and he still <laughs> has to offset his house with a border. So, um, so I don't want all that. I don't want like super expensive housing and I don't want to fight traffic and I don't want to, you know, and sure it's beautiful and there's the ocean and there's all this great hiking that's, you know, Michigan's got some pretty cool hiking too, but there's all this great stuff, but I can do that when I visit, you know, like I, Muhammad and I went on an amazing hike while we were there and it was great, you know? Um, so here what I've got is, um, uh, a nice community that's affordable, um, that's great to raise my kids in. And you know, I mean, after making friends all over the place, um, as soon as any sane person has children in New York, they're looking for some place like Kalamazoo to move to. Um, and some people, sane people that have children in San Francisco, now that prices have gotten so high, are looking for some place else to move. So um, don't be fooled. Like a lot of, if, if those of you guys that are at the kind of exiting college age, you're seeing a lot of people go out there. When you get to be my age, you're gonna watch a bunch of them come back. And 
some of them will come back here, some of them will come back to other areas in the country that are very much like this. Um, but it's, it's what you want ebbs and flows over your life. So, so the last question before I open it up. So that's the reason why you're here. Yep. How can the startup ecosystem, specifically the tech startup ecosystem in Kalamazoo improve? Mentors, investors, coders, attitude change, what should it be? Um, well, I think like there's a couple of big things. And one of them I learned when we were out there at this, there's a startup grind, you know, national conference. And there were two really evident things at the conference. It was internet, it, and the, the cool part about it was most of the time when I go out there to conferences, it's like 80% people from Silicon Valley and the other 20% is people like me that are associated with Silicon Valley in some way and they come. This conference was so different. 50% of the people at least were from all sorts of countries all over the world. People from Kenya and people from you know, Japan and all international. So the flavor was, was I liked the flavor a lot more. There was a lot less kind of you know, one-upsmanship about how well your startup's doing or how much you just raised or whatever. It was much more just encouraging each other. And so there are two things that I think would be amazing, and we've been talking about them at Startup Zoo. One is elevating the value of doing things and then sharing your learning. So not talking about ideas, oh, I got this great idea, and wouldn't it be cool if this or that, you know? Don't do that. Just make something, do something, learn something, and then share those learnings with everybody. Um, much more effective and I think way better for the community. And then two, a give first um, mentality. So, you know, we all have projects that we're working on and things that we want to do, but you'll be amazed if you walk around and say, how can I help as many people as possible? How then when you are just at home working on your project or at the office working on your project, how many people start offering to help you? how easy it is to get people to help you if you've given so much that people are like, there's just pent up demand for you to, it, people are just waiting to be able to help you back. Um, and I think that just builds the community if we all think about that. So I think those are two cultural pieces. You know, everybody talks about, um, as I've learned more and more about Michigan, I think less and less that there's not any money. Um, and more and more that, um, there's plenty of money. Some of it understands where the tech sector is now, and some of it doesn't. But that's just an education problem. That's not a that's not a the money doesn't exist uh, problem. Um, and I think time helps to solve that. Um, I think I think there's I think money and and also money from outside Michigan comes into Michigan all the time to find hardcore doers that are making stuff like. Uh, I, I know somebody in Ann Arbor who, you know, two or three VCs showed up at his office with a term sheet. It was kind of their sneaky, you know, we'll, we'll create urgency. If you've ever in sales, you're supposed to create urgency. We'll create urgency by showing up at the door with a term sheet and saying, sign it before we leave. You know, um, these are Silicon Valley people, you know, but they knew, they learned about what his business was doing, they corresponded with him and whatever. and the money came and found the good idea. So I'm not so worried about that. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think we should, as entrepreneurs, we shouldn't think about the money. We should focus on building something amazing. And the money finds you if you build something amazing. Um, uh, to a certain extent. I mean, if you need money, you gotta go get it. But, but I think a lot of us need money a lot less than we think. Um, it's, we're attracted to the idea that we think it's going to solve all of our business problems, but it doesn't. It makes more. <laughs> when you have someone else's money and a mom and a dad watching over your shoulder and checking that you're doing everything right, there's some additional, some additional headroom there that you got to deal with. Anyway. All right, I'm going to open up to questions. I'm going to pass the microphone around so you, everyone can hear your question, all right? So you ready for that, Dan? Sure. All right. All right. So I actually have a request, not a question. Mm -hmm. I know you're not playing songs right now, <laughs> but free bird. <laughs> I think it would be really valuable for everybody here who hasn't heard it to hear you tell how your process of giving early on in the corporate company led to your Taco Bell drive-through experience with Google. That's an awesome story. 
Oh, okay. Um, so the you know so I said already that a lot of growth has come out of being early, um, and one of, and the kind of one of the first areas we were early in was um, the idea that you know that Google's tools that they were being used in the consumer space were any good for the business space. So Google was kind of exploring that, but nobody believed it at that time. People were like, you're using your Gmail for work? Like the only people that were doing that were like one guy in his house, and it's because that's just what he had. But, um, but everybody else was using Exchange. And what we, what we realized was um, spam was becoming a bigger problem at that time. It was becoming, it was taking a lot of our time to retune spam filters and do all kinds of manual stuff and upgrade to better ones and all this stuff. And I just, it, just, it was pretty dumb uh, realization, but I just look in my, in my Gmail and I'm like, I'm never getting spam in my Gmail. Huh, Google just kind of has this solved. And then they released you know, their very early version of, here's Gmail for business, you get to do it at your domain. There's a couple of really rudimentary you know, tools, but essentially it's just Gmail at your own domain. Um, and we started using that with all of our clients almost immediately just because, just only because the spam was better. And that was the key thing. And so we started just participating in Google's forums, which were that there weren't very many people in there because nobody was using the product. You know, a lot of people were using Gmail, but nobody was using any of the business tools. You know, everybody thought Google's kind of silly. Google doesn't, Google can't work with businesses. Google's a consumer company that makes free stuff and never charges for anything. Um, uh, so, but, but we saw the value and started using it with customers and started basically being very active in the forums, helping to answer people's questions. Um, and at the time I thought, you know, this is nice to do. It helps me and other guys learn about the technology from problems that we're not seeing, but we may see in the future, helping to solve those. Um, and our visibility helping people there is essentially what led to the Taco Bell experience, which was um, I'm, in, I'm in the drive-through for Taco Bell and my phone rings. And first, number one rule, do not answer your phone when you're in the drive-through for Taco Bell. That's just a rep recipe for disaster because you're gonna, and then you're gonna get your food, and then you're gonna have your phone, and you're gonna try and talk to the person. And the so I'm just dumb enough to like just pick it up while I'm in the drive-through. And this guy says, "Hi, I'm Peter Griffin from Google." Immediately, you know, if anybody's seen what is it, Family Guy, you know, Peter Griffin is like a well-known, you know, cartoon character. I'm immediately like, this is a wind up. This is my, one of my friends, like <laughs> totally just messing with me. Um, and so I'm like, yeah, sure you are, Peter Griffin from Google. What do you want? You know, um, and he's like, really nice guy. He's like, no, I really am Peter Griffin from Google. And we're, we, we, you know, we're starting this channel program and we want you guys to kind of join it before we launch it to try out all the, you know, see if it works for you, basically. And so that was, we were one of about 10 um, resellers worldwide that they offered that to. And, and we basically, that led to a relationship that was at a deeper level than people that came afterwards. Because at that time, that channel program was the idea of one guy, whose name was Jeff, and Peter was his probably intern helper guy and that was Google's channel programs at that time, Jeff and Peter. <laughs> and so I got to be really good friends with Jeff and Peter, and then they built all that, you know, all that, I think it was actually Jeff's, you've heard of Google's 20% time. I'm pretty sure, I don't, I can't verify this for sure, but I think the entire idea of working with businesses in a channel program was Jeff's 20% project, um, which is now a uh, billion dollar business, oh, well beyond a billion dollar business, um, working offering Google's tools to businesses, governments, and education. Um, so, yeah, so eventually, you know, I talked to Peter and he explained it to me and I was really excited about it. And I ended up actually going out to Google and um, sitting in a training with a bunch of, most of the people there were Googlers because they're learning about these tools that are getting released and the progress just right alongside us. Google's very like, move fast, um, and so they're like, we're not going to wait to have a specialized you know, event or anything for resellers. We're just going to bring the resellers along for the internal stuff that we're doing. And so I, that was my first trip to the Wonka factory. When was that? When was that? 
Um, that was in 2007, I think. I'm so bad with years. I forget how old I am and my family members, and it's really embarrassing. But I think it was 2007. It's a long answer. You guys need to tell me to shut up. If I go that long, then the next question. point did you decide that you didn't want to be a CEO anymore and because it, it sounds like you pretty much want to keep starting businesses which is cool yeah. but what like what's the story behind like where did you get to a point where you wanted to switch over and start working on another business um, I think I think I really felt like you know the early years, I'm making a lot of mistakes. There's a lot of ups and downs. Then when things really started to take off, in the early days of that, I really felt like, wow, this is such a natural fit for my strengths and weaknesses and what I do. And then at some point, it got big enough that I started feeling, this. It, I have not felt this was a natural fit in a long time. I'm learning a lot. You know, I'm forcing myself to learn about things like financial analysis and legal stuff and insurance and um, and a bunch of things that are outside my wheelhouse and I'm learning them I'm probably learning them slower than I should just just the whole mojo just slowed down and eventually it probably took me two or three years of that before I kind of realized huh and I read some books that were really helpful too about different people's strengths and I read this book called um, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits um, that talks about different stages of business growth. And so that's where I got the zero to 10 million, 10 million to 100 million, um, 100 million to you know, 500 million, I think was their, was their brackets in the book. Um, and I realized basically after a long time that there's probably somebody out there that is better at this next scaling stage that we're sort of entering than I am, a more natural fit. And I think I could succeed and learn those things, but how much better is it to have someone that like, the way they're built is compatible with running a business that size. And the way I'm built, I wanna, I wanna make things up as I go along. And I wanna kinda like engage in a little jazz. But then as soon as something gets big enough, the key to making it successful is doing things the same way and better and better and better and better and really honing in on a repeatable model. And you can't do that if I'm playing jazz all the time, <laughs> you know, so my instincts are out of sync. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, okay. thank you. I'm gonna ask the last question here. Oh, Jack, got it, okay. Have you got a, uh, an outside board? And if you do, how do you use them? Um, that's actually that's actually something. Oh, there's, there goes my phone. Um, that's actually something that is is really a goal for us in the next. Um, the answer the answer today is we don't have any. We have a board, but but the board consists of all people that work for Newmind at this point, and we realize, and I've known for a while, that that's probably not. Um, that's probably not the best long-term solution as we grow. Uh, so, um, so that's really one of our goals in the next several years is to find the right fit. Um, and really, really what we're looking for is not just you know, the sort of typical invite someone and, and give them some incentive to serve on the board. We'd really rather have somebody that is really excited about the space that we're in. So I'm thinking maybe an, an angel investor that wants to take a stake might be ideal, but I'm learning about all that stuff as, as is Matt, our new CEO, and Ryan, who's also co-owner. Um, but we need that. I mean, that, we recognize that that's something that we need. Um, and part of the goal of NewMind actually is to offer ownership, to diversify the ownership over time so that there's a stability there that um, that can stand the test of time. So if something happens to me, there's enough people in, in, invested in it enough that it doesn't hurt everyone else. 
um, something happens to Ryan, if something happens to Matt. So we want to increase that stability and get those outside folks, but we're learning about the best ways to do that, I guess. All right, any other questions before we close here? Dan will stay around and, and, hold, and hold court and answer any questions if you like. So let's give it up to him, all right? Thanks. I just want to say real, I want to say real quick, um, this John Muller works really, really hard on all these events, and I think we should give him a hand, too. And also, one more thing about the, the startup community here, um, and that is that I think, a lot, I think a lot of times we think about how do we make Kalamazoo grow, but if you think about Kalamazoo and that give first, you know, there's a lot of people that have gone out of this community to help in other places. Like right now we've got Matt Sorensen and Nick Woodhams, which are part of our community. They're in, at one of the best accelerators in the world in uh, Techstars Boston right now. Their demo day is at the end of April. Um, we gave them Give First. Our community gave them to another community, the Boston community. And they were in San Francisco for a while. We gave them to the San Francisco community. And I think we should maybe start thinking about what we do in our community as a hub that connects what's going on in technology around the world rather than how do we get stuff here and then just keep it and hold on to it really, really tight. And I think we'll, we'll grow, that was, I'm sorry, that was something I'm really passionate about and something that popped into my head as we were closing, so. Point number three, right? Point number three. There you go. Point All right. Three. Another hand for Dan, yeah, thanks, right?